Hello, I'm Magnus Alias. Uh, I'm here presenting our um, uh, museum uh, small team. Uh, my colleague uh, Pilla Runnel is not unfortunately here, so you have to satisfy it with me. So I will try to do my, my best to uh, give you an, uh, an overview of what we have been doing and what, what is the context of the museum in the context of digital, um, digital exhibits, what, how we are really thinking on them when we are creating them as a curators. So uh, after the first two morning presentations, it's kind of good to add one more layer to you, to this uh, uh, external view on the digital exhibits, maybe. So um, I am a curator in the museum. My official title is research secretary, so I do also a lot of administrative work but I'm a curator, my background is in ethnology and uh, also in a communication studies. So in, in the process of developing different museum exhibits and exhibitions, uh, the context of communication is also now coming with us or with me at the moment to the presentation. I'm coming from the museum which many of you maybe have visited and many of you have chance to see on Friday. It's a huge museum building in the centre of Tartu, which has been the dream. My clock isn't going, so I think it's good. I can just speak, I'm just not noticing that. So the museum is, is a huge building for a museum like we. We are ethnographic museum, or cultural history museum maybe, if you compare it to the history museum where we are now. It has been a huge challenge, firstly, to have the decision to make the museum in our historical areas, locations, and the other is really to make the building. Luckily, we had a lot of time to plan the museum and the buildings because the decisions with the finances took a lot of time, so we had many, many years' time to really think what we want to do in the museum. Um, I think the first challenge what we had was like how to think what the Estonian people to whom we are making the museum or we, to whom we have made the museum, what they really would like to have in the museum and what is their context. And of course, like always, when you have, um, when you're going too deep to something, you will realize that you have a lot of different viewpoints and there's something you just have to decide yourself what kind of position you will make. So we have tried to make with our different exhibitions, different cultural programs, different, um, different Estonian people with a cultural interest or with not any cultural interest to this kind of to grasp them to our museum. So we have, um, like normally if we are talking here on the users, so we like to talk also in the museum of like a target group who is maybe the person who never comes to a museum, but there's always something we want to also offer for them. Even if it's a stupid scandal in the yellow newspaper, it's still something that puts people to think maybe what the museum is, or maybe one day they would come to a museum. So in, uh, in the presentation, I will go more about the users. So they are the people who have some kind of contact with our digital collection, so they have um, they are using databases of the museum or the museum contact in any other ways. But as we have done a lot of participatory um, um, interventions, we also like to call them, then this is the group who is the most dearest to us, but that's the smallest one and that's the problem always how to keep them around the museum after. But we like to think of the public who is never maybe coming to, to the museum, also as one of our groups with whom we have to relate to. So, uh, I will take one of the exhibitions, Estonian uh, exhibition, which is called Encounters. It's a, a big exhibition in 3,500 square meters. It's, it has a lot of content. 
I never knew that we are able to make so much contact as, content, uh, content as the curators. And um, its concept is to tell the story of people who have been living in Estonia from the nowadays to the first settlers, or if you start from the other side, from the first settlers in the, in the Estonia to the nowadays. And it's mostly based on people's stories, as much as we can have the stories of, of people. And um, for example, for the Middle Ages, the stories are coming from um, the source material as the court protocols, for example, but so they are more fictional and historical uh, stories, which are made normally always with the researchers who are working with that area. So anyway, the story what we have should be the, the most valued one, what we or the most valid one, what we will have from nowadays. So there's a big research layer what should be out in the exhibition. And there's a big uh, design level, which is influencing also the content. And in the end, the person is in the exhibition and they will have something what they have to, have to see. And the person is the one who makes the decision what they really understand in the end. Uh, there has been, uh, I think, around 2,000 different people who have been interviewed or who can find the stories in the uh, exhibition. And this has always been kind of challenge how people see themselves in the museum. Uh, there has been many times when people say that they are really happy that the researchers are coming and making field works and making interviews or films. And they are starting to be kind of hesitant always that, um, I don't know, maybe I don't want to be in the public or maybe I want to be in the public. So this is the kind of ethical dilemma where we as a researchers are always managing is is the thing what is out there in the public in the exhibition is it something that is okay to be or not and what is the context but i'm sure that normally we as a curators are more um, rough on selves than people who put who would like to be a lot maybe in the public but i found one quote for, from one lady and uh, who was explaining on the uh, it's a polit political history room which where people are telling what the national flag colors make to them. And there are three ladies who meet every August and make an Estonian flag color shot. So it's a sweet story what the old ladies from who are now in 80s, how they are thinking and what the flag for them is and what it means. So, of course, this is not the only thing what they are thinking. So, in the one moment when they understood that the museum is a huge, big building and it will be ready, they found that it's totally stupid what they are doing in the museum. And, and so, in that moment, we managed to say to them that, please, come down, you can come to see. If you don't like the film there, we can always take it out from the exhibition. But as they saw the other people's reactions in the exhibition and this kind of sweet, uh, sweet um, feeling that the film is making on the other audiences, so I think they are really happy to be there in the end. But this is the dilemma what we are normally having. We also used the technique of uh, printing our mannequins because when you are making a museum or the exhibition, you have a lot of finances and after that it's gone. So you have to always think how you will manage it in the end. So we used the technique to make uh, scans of real people in the exhibition and, um, and to print them out that they would fit so into the, for example, national costumes, what are in the exhibition. And it's quite often then you can see people in the exhibition who go there, who find themselves in the exhibition, they mannequin and then they make a picture with them. So this personal touch with the exhibition content is something what is really helping us in, in this sense to get this relevance. But you can't put all the millions of Estonians to the exhibition. I think as we started with the participatory ideas like 20, 15 years ago, we, we had really positivistic view on what the participation can be and what it can do for the museum. And one of the main ideas what we had was that the particip participatory way of making exhibition or 
showing different viewpoints on the history. This will make people to broader their worldview. And now doing a lot of visitor research, I have to admit that this is something that normally, mostly doesn't really work. As there is a quote from one museum expert article on the museum uh, uh, exhibition making. So the thing what we can see that people normally use the museum as a, as a tool to get kind of recognition today, identity today, um, world view. And this is what they normally see, what they hear in the exhibition. They don't, they don't normally see and hear the viewpoints, but are not maybe the same ones as they have. So if the ultra-right person comes to the museum, they can find themselves in there, and if the ultra-liberal one will come, they will also find themselves. Not always, but, but this is something what we, we hope that the exhibition will maybe help to realize, but it doesn't really work in that, that sense. So the exhibitions. We have a lot of different uh, uh, exhibition things, what we call uh, multimedia. Kas see viistist niinud, et on kõige lõpuni või seal on küsimus, et kas ees? Ja siis on küsimused. So we have a lot of different exhibition uh, exhibits, we call them, and they are all having a special purpose in the exhibition, what they should do, what they are, what is the idea, what the person should get from these things in the museum. We use a lot of uh, interactive uh, touch screens, of course. We use a lot of physical interaction where the digital is also related. We use documentaries, we use um, e-ink screens, for example. I will just show a few of them. So uh, the digital uh, objects are mostly um, so interactive uh, touch screens. They are, they are normally made in a way that they, they should be easy to use, as the museum is made for almost for one million person who should come their way to the museum. So the dilemma was always how to make them uh, in a way that the person who is in 80s can manage with them and how the person who is in uh, who is four years will manage with them, which is normally not a problem, but, but how the interactive uh, things will manage with, uh, with the older generation. So uh, I'm also using the word of two layers, but not in the same context as Mika was using. So the two layers for us is that normally the screen has one data and then there's another one. But that's the two layers, what uh, me as a curator I have. And they, they should be quite easy to use when the curators and the designers were planning it. Uh, we do a lot of audience research to kind of understand how this kind of physical interaction and the digital layers and how the visitors are really managing with the exhibition. Also because uh, we don't use any audio guides, we don't use any extra technical solutions what you can use from the phone. So from the start the idea was that people will come to the exhibition normally with their family or their friends and they will have discussions in the museum. So we will not put them to some kind of uh, tools, other tools to use, which is something what we have been starting to reorganize in our thinkings that maybe we should still think about it to maybe start to use something. So we do a lot of audience research, a lot of observations, a lot of interviews, or maybe not anymore as the five years of museum opening, it's something what we are kind of full of this visitor feedback. We do user tests for the uh, screens and different databases, and we have been using our nice tool, uh, which is called e-ticket. So basically, if you go as a foreigner to the museum, you get the ticket, they will ask you what language you want the exhibition to make, to have. So if you want to have it in German or Latvian or Finnish, you will have the ticket, you can change the language. Me, who is uh, responsible of the e-tickets, uh, so I will see in the evening how people have been using the exhibition, which text they have been reading. I can see which path they have been taking 
but it doesn't give me any context. I can just see that somebody has changed the text. I will not see what is is that is, was the text really important to the person or not. If I'm taking the observation sheets, I can see from there that like there was a small. Um, this is a tear, basically. So I can see that somebody has been looking that kind of um, uh, exhibit, and it has brought out some emotions. So in planning the exhibitions, we tried to think on how these digital exhibits will be part of this participatory uh, exhibition. So we used uh, this kind of seven, or we are using now the, also this kind of seven scales model to understand what the exhibit is and how the person should be interacting with the exhibit. So the first thing is the space, what we are looking, uh, is it something that is only usable in the museum or is it something that people can also use after the visit, for example, with some databases uh, from the phone? Is it, is it something that people can uh, influence themselves or it's a fixed data from some kind of historical event? Is it something that people can use or have it like a privately, but it's a public thing if you upload some materials. Or can you use it uh, with many of your friends or colleagues with whom you're going to exhibition or alone? Is it a documentary or fiction? Is it collaborative by its sense? Or it's more authoritative that the museum curator says how the things are and you can't really make any other uh, addings. So one example, what I will bring here is the Baltic Way exhibit. It took two months of my life to make the database of this thing. So I don't know how much time technicians normally spend for making something. As a curator, I think I spent two months of my life to making this database. So it's part of the story in nowadays, or well, the recent history, which tells about freedom of speech. And we were thinking what is the most important uh, freedom of speech um, kind of um, testimony where a lot of or most of the Estonian people have been taking part, then this is the Baltic way. So the historical context is that maybe for some people who were part of this Estonian national awakening, the 1987 was maybe a time when they started to make the... Estonian Republic again. For them, maybe 1989 was the time when the Republic was basically made, although it took two years to have it politically. But for most of the Estonian people, this was the event when they realized that, like, this is now we don't have any way going back, basically. So it was uh, 23rd of August, uh, an anniversary of Molotov Ribbentrop Pact, which is the most important uh, Soviet period document for the Baltic states. And it was decided to make the Baltic, uh, the people chain from Vilnius, from Lithuania to Estonia, to Tallinn. And this 600 kilometers was officially filled with people and it was huge mass masses that, that were participating there. So, uh, making the ex exhibit, uh, we decided that uh, the, the thing, what people relate the most themselves is uh, where they see themselves. So, we started to collect photos from the personal archives, uh, Estonian, Latvian, Lithuanian museum archives. And, of course, we had the idea that people can also tag themselves. Designer found it not so nice. Of course, we wanted to put some... Um, data on the pictures that what it is or where you can find the picture. This was also not related as uh, or considered as an important one. So this is uh, the thing that comes out in, in the end. So we were kind of trying to think that this is the exhibit what will be relatable for most of the Estonians and those Estonians who are not part of the, who have not been part of the Baltic Way then they can maybe just try to find the parents or grandparents from this chain of people. And it seems that that's the most uh, relatable thing that normally Estonians have with a, with a Baltic Way uh, event, even if we are trying to make some other exhibits, but this personal touch seems to be the most working one. 
And you can also send your pictures to the museum, so they should be added to this database. And the database base is easy, so I had the Excel file with photos and the kilometers, and I had to put them together. So I don't know if it's important, but basically, the private history will get public to this uh, database. Uh, you can use it with, with many people, and of course you have the curator who has been designing all the exhibit, but it's not something that you would, um, but you can influence it in the many ways. So we have, um, the exhibit gets a lot of attention, a lot of feedback. Uh, firstly, all the Latvian and Lithuanian uh, visitors are the ones who relate the most with that exhibit in the, in the museum. And there's a lot of people who really come and find themselves, because the, the view looks kind of easy, that you have the cities and then you have the pictures, which is not, of course, very exact, because normally people don't know when they were, where they were standing. So for the second layer, we have... Um, a map where you can put where you started to walk or where you started to drive to the Baltic Way and when you don't know where you really was in somewhere in the forest. So these people would also have a chance to participate, which is not, of course, the same. So there's a lot of people who find themselves. Normally they contact the museum to get the photo. So contact the museums normally seems that uh, is that they are going to information desk and they say that I found myself from the database. And then I'm the one who looks my database through and will see uh, where, where from which archive the photo is coming from. Uh, yes. And it seems... Uh, that we have done from a curator, curator perspective, that we have done a very easy database. But always when we take the user tests with people, then it comes out that it's horribly complicated if you go to the very, very small details in the end. So I'm trying to conclude myself. So being an exhibition curator, we always tend to use, in our museum, for example, the digital, um, layers in the museum, not maybe so much for, for the fun, but, but for showing this kind of big amounts of data, because we know that in this way all the digital content in the exhibitions will be something that we can, um, we can manage. It doesn't get so old, it doesn't need so much updates maybe, so mostly they are related to the big amount of data, what would give also the visitor the chance to see what they really are interested about. If we have some historical photo collections, normally people always tend to find the first relevance from the content, from the, the personal perspectives, for example. So if you are coming from some locations, okay, it's Tallinn, but you have relatives somewhere in the Estonia, then you normally relate to the location what is known for you. Or if you are in a certain life cycle period, then you relate to these kind of events with the data. So we like to make these things more physical, but we like to put them also more in a, in a virtual way, so that people could take them with them and they could use them also after. So, and for the last one, I just pointed out that uh, it's... Uh, I don't know how normally with the digital databases people make it, but it, this emotional engagement of the same digital content in the exhibition is, is quite probable to create so that it would be very emotional and it brings up the emotions that people would have um, that would make maybe the relation with the exhibition content and the, the person who is coming to the museum, who finds to have a meaningful or remembering uh, event, then this would probably help to make it more, more better or more sustainable, this relation between people and the museum. But I will stop here. And you can ask questions. <laughs> Thank you, Agnes. <laughs> There is a question in the audience. We'll take this first. Then. Yeah. 
Hello. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation, Agnes. So my question is, uh, do you make a digital participatory projects with your community? And who are your targeting groups in this regard? I, I, I think uh, the museum is big. There's a lot of different topics, but we have kind of uh, divided all the different topics or different exhibitions to different people. So there's something what we do with the youngsters, and these are the, for example, the content that has been created in the way that the youngster will be feeling themselves well, basically. And then the content and the target group is kind of coming from, from these youngsters. And maybe if Raivo goes there, he can find that it's totally boring content because it's not made for them. But I think he will find something else somewhere else in the exhibition. But normally we work in the way that um, it's a hard work always to find the community if the community doesn't want to be founded. And normally if we see that it doesn't really work, we leave the topic because we see that it, there's no point to, to try to include somebody who doesn't want to be included. But we have had many very successful um, accidental participatory projects. I think the last one, as we are preparing an exhibition for next year about body, and how people have been re looking at the body in history and how we are looking at the body nowadays. So we, there's one topic on a, a very active sport making um, people, for example. So we were collecting data from the the money active uh, the clocks like spot. smart watches smart watches mm -hmm. yes like how many steps runnings and so on so in this case we found with that um, community i think we had 7000 persons who sent us the smart watch data what we can use in the exhibition so it really really much depends on the topic who we have but this was accidental so maybe there was some facebook groups of the sportive people who uh, shared this information. And, and of course, I would hope that these 7,000 would come to exhibition. They don't find themselves. They, they data is somewhere. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mm. Thank you very much. OK, there's an associated question with this one on, that's going on online. And then we, we go back to, to the question in the audience here. There's one, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Have you done any user studies of interaction with content remotely? So your exhibitions digitally. Would digital content layers work best remotely at home or school? Or, or do, you, do, you need, do they need to come to the museum? Yes, the remotely because we made the new museum into the new building. So I, I have to admit that our main target was to get people to the museum, yeah. firstly. So we haven't really, we have content outside, but it, it normally, it's not so well curated, I have mm -hmm. to admit. So it's more, it's there, if somebody needs it, we can say where to find it. Yeah, okay. But measuring how the, uh, <clears throat> the your digital collections, you know, how they are being used by people remotely, anything you're doing in that direction? We have MUIS in Estonia, so I know mm. our museum collections are the most used because we have the biggest ones. I mm. think we haven't done so much that they would be in use. Mm. But I think we are not so digital as a museum. We have really many things what we should try to develop. So from the beginning we have had uh, a layer in the Estonian exhibition which is called Take Museum to Home. Mm -hmm. People have the email address uh, on the ticket. So basically all the text that they have been looking in the exhibition, they can also see it when they go to the web page. But it's kind of still in a prototype version. So if people say and ask that I would like to take some things to home, like this Baltic Way database, you can take it. But it's not, uh, it's not ready. It's it's thing what we are still trying to develop because mm -hmm. we have devel developed it for the exhibition, but still the digital w mm, database in the mobile phone is totally other thing, and we don't find that it's ready. So we haven't done really a lot of reporting on that. You haven't launched it yet. Yes. Okay, we had a question here in the audience still. Uh, down there in the first row, please. 
Hi, Agnes. Thank you very much for that answer. Actually, that was also my question. Um, and I'm thrilled to hear that you are considering um, setting up the content f that you made accessible at the exhibition for future use also at home. Because I do agree with you that there's tons of data that we could bombard the museum visitor with. But it's always much easier if they just kind of browse at the museum, they engage with the objects, and then maybe later on they take a look uh, further. So I'll be very curious to see if you further develop this and you feel it's ready for further analysis. Now, my other question had to do with, um, um, with this emotional engagement that you're trying to seek and as part of the participatory museum and, and, and so on. Um, have you, I saw in your diagram, you note if people cry. That seems like uh, quite a um, deep emotional um, uh, prick you have uh, made in the visitor. Is there any, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure how to say this, but uh, if you take it to the extreme, let's say, is there any post-traumatic help at the end of the visit? Or is there a way that you sort of help the visitor when you know, as you go through this uh, process, you get so emotional. Is there a moment or have you thought about how to resolve all of these um, emotions before you leave the museum exhibit? Uh, very good question. And the emotions and normally the negative ones are the ones that museums don't use at all because you find it complicated. And this is something what the theorists are maybe arguing that maybe the, because the stronger emotions are the negative ones that should we provoke them more? But this has not been our intention at all. So basically I think the most emotional things what we have in the exhibition, they are related to the historical events that have been happening in Estonia. And I think the most surprising one is to see, for example, Finnish, Finnish people in the exhibition. And if they look at something from the uh, Second World War or, uh, or, or from this national awakening uh, period, so also they have these kind of emotions. So it's not just that the local ones. But I think the overall idea of the exhibition has always been to kind of empower the people in the sense that the exhibition tells the story how people have been managing in different times uh, in Estonia. Like, it doesn't matter what is the political, environmental, social context you have, but you manage somehow because you have to do it. And the exhibition kind of tells the story how people manage or try to find the ways to manage in time or with the lives, basically. So I can't tell to you that we have been having some special parts for that, but we have been always thinking that this is the way the exhibition should work, like in overall sense. But if if you take the dilemma, di dilemma stories, maybe which go lower from Second World War, they don't don't work at all, basically. So you have the same dilemmas from in the Middle Ages or in uh, 1905 with the 1905 revolution, but it's too far. Nobody cares, but it's something what we were thinking in, the, in before, that maybe these stories could be relatable to nowadays because the dilemmas are the same, but it doesn't work. You need a personal thing. But still, a packet of tissues and a chair next to the yes. uh, exhibit yes. where most people cry would be, would be helpful. There's an offer from, uh, I guess, Vahur uh, in, the, uh, in the online questions uh, uh, to take the exhibit of the uh, Baltic Way out of the kiosk in the museum and, and put it on the platform of Aya Paik mm -hmm. that was uh, introduced here yeah, yesterday. Yeah, I this think the only the thing is the Lithuanian and Latvian uh, pictures because we don't have rights for them. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, it's That's doable. something that needs to be worked yeah. out. Uh, we still have a little bit of time, and, and there's a question here about these two months of your life mm -hmm. as a curator, mm -hmm. and whether the, you know, what would you have liked to have as a digital curator of this exhibition? What kind of tools would have helped you? Was there anything in the Museum 4.0 package that was demonstrated earlier this morning that would have helped you? Yes, as a curator and. Uh, as, as I'm also collecting things, I, I appreciate a lot when people make good uh, vocabularies, uh, good legends. 
So this is the thing what mm -hmm. you start to really appreciate if you need to find something. But I think the most of the time takes to find the right things, make agreements, uh, write to different small museums around the Baltics and ask, do you have photos on Baltic Way? Because you can't find them still. So it's kind of strange that these kind of things are the ones which are still on our way to really get contact with the collections. That the digitalizing is maybe one thing, but then how to find these pictures and how to, how to get them to your hands, basically. And all these law problems are huge, normally. How you can use it, for how long time, how you can present them. So, yes. Mm. But as a curator, I started to think that it's really important how I make my legends and my... Uh, I can see some colleagues and people from in the in the room. So after that, I'm really... I don't put for the photo only the photo name, but I put something else on the photo also, because maybe the artificial intelligence will not find it yeah. one day, and yeah. then it's me who have to do it anyway. <laughs> okay, people in this audience know that context <laughs> is king, so... Yes. Thank you. Uh, any more very quick questions to Agnes before we move on to Maya? No. Thank you very much. Thank you.